Pfizer's first mRNA data released for the latest iteration of the vaccine, adapted for the Omicron variant of the virus. This while concerns of the government pandemic response continues to mount. That is the subject of today's episode. And so, from Trial Site News, I am Adrian, and our episode is starting right now. Last week, Pfizer and BioNTech released data associated with their Omicron BA4 and BA5 adapted bivalent COVID-19 vaccine. The companies have been criticized, along with the government here in the U.S., for releasing the product to the market prior to the completion of clinical trials. And rightfully so. See, typically, before such products are authorized on an emergency basis or formally approved, they are subjected to extensive testing in randomized controlled trials. In the case of this Omicron subvariant-focused booster, however, the regulatory authorities, such as the U.S. Food and Drug Administration here in America, accepted the investigational product on an emergency use authorization, otherwise known as the EUA, basis due to animal data and high-risk-based assessment of the mRNA technology platform, meaning prior clinical trials and real-world data. Both BioNTech and Pfizer are sponsoring a clinical trial called NCT0547203, and this is evaluating the safety, tolerability, and immunogenicity of the BNT162B2-based bivalent booster based on a 30 microgram booster of the investigational product. The product is still investigational, and it is still under the EUA. So here is the current situation. The US FDA has authorized on an emergency basis a 30 microgram dose of the Omicron BA4 and BA5 adapted bivalent vaccine for persons aged 12 years and up because of the durability challenges with existing mRNA vaccine products as the original vaccine was developed to the wild type or Wuhan variant or original version if you prefer. While the RNA virus, meanwhile, has mutated many times over. Now, worth noting here, the original vaccine was promoted heavily as a means to outright control the virus. However, by summer of 2021, it became very apparent to this media that breakthrough infections would become commonplace, and eventually the government industry healthcare sector's promotions shifted from controlling transmission to reducing risks of morbidity and mortality. Less chance of hospitalizations, less chance of dying if you take the vaccine. Shifting goalposts. Nothing to see here. Now, four total doses were authorized, including the two-dose primary series of both mRNA-based vaccines, Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna, and now the Omicron BA4 and BA5 adapted by bivalent vaccine, now authorized on an emergency basis for individuals aged 12 and up. Now, this emergency use authorization was issued without clinical trial data, which raised concerns among even the most staunch vaccine proponents, such as Paul Ofit, a member of the FDA's Independent Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, otherwise known as the VRB PAC. And so, unsurprising considering all the broken promises from the federal and state governments about ending the pandemic with the original set of mandated vaccinations, to date, less than 5% of all eligible populations in the United States have opted to receive this latest vaccine dose. So, what about this latest emergency use authorization for children as young as 12 years old? Well, most children are not at high risk of COVID-19 at this point, with a higher degree of natural immunity and or vaccine-induced immunity coupled with the fact that morbidity and mortality incidents are incredibly low in this young cohort or age group. Now, should a surge happen again and mass vaccination be pushed onto this vulnerable cohort, there isn't nearly enough data to support broad booster administration to this vulnerable age group. There just isn't the data at this time. So let's talk about the current study data for this latest iteration of the vaccine. The Phase 2-3 clinical trial started in late July of this year and runs through March 2023 and targets 1,143 participants. The actual study is about six months and should wrap up in mid to late January, but the full study doesn't complete until after monitoring is done a few months later. Investigating the safety tolerability and immunogenicity of the bivalent booster products in adults and its ability to prevent COVID-19, 
The trial sites are recruiting participants who are healthy to receive a single dose of the study vaccine at the first study clinic and would need to return to the study clinic at at least four more times. So where are we right now with all of this? Well, BioNTech and Pfizer have issued a press release declaring that the 30 microgram booster dose of the Omicron BA4 and BA5 adapted bivalent vaccine demonstrated a substantial increase in the Omicron BA4 and BA5 neutralizing antibody response above pre-booster levels based on sera taken seven days after administration with similar responses seen across individuals aged 18 to 55 years of age and those older than 55 years of age, 40 participants in each age group. The sponsors report that when comparing the bivalent Omicron BA4 and BA5 booster versus the original vaccine targeting the wild type SARS-CoV-2 virus in the more el risk elderly cohort, meaning 55 and up, a quote 30 microgram booster dose of the original Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine elicited more limited increases in the neutralizing antibody response against the Omicron BA and BA BA4 and BA5 variants. Now, the preliminary data reported on thus far suggests, according to the pharmaceutical companies, that a 30 microgram dose of the booster is anticipated to provide better protection against the Omicron variants than the original vaccine for young and older adults. Now, something of concern here. They use the word anticipated. Now, why is this concerning? Well, anticipates me makes it apparent that the sponsors have limited data for younger adults to young persons. Essentially, it means that they just don't know yet, but naturally, they wouldn't want to include that in a press release. Additionally, as far as safety, there are issues with the first vaccine, so there will undoubtedly be issues with this booster as well. Of course, according to official data, safety incidents is relatively rare, but that is a relative term, rare. See, you have enough people get vaccinated, and even if a side effect is rare, the sheer volume of people involved means you will still end up with a large number of folks potentially affected. For example, with about 226 million people vaccinated in the, in the US, we estimate that there could be anywhere from 500,000 to 2 million vaccine injuries in the US alone. Side effects happen, and the key here is ensuring that the vaccine compensation laws are modernized, especially when considering legal mandates. So how are the sponsors evaluating immunogenicity, or the ability of cells' tissues to provoke an immune response? Well, the sponsors employ the use of SARS-CoV-2 live virus fluorescent focus reduction neutralization test, or the FFRNT, assay based on data collected from the trial site staff from the participants at seven days post-second booster dose from participants age 55 and up. This data is compared to seven-day post sera from 40 participants older than 55 years of age and received three prior doses of BNT162B2, encoding the wild-type spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, as well as a second booster with BNT162B2 wild-type. Now, are the sponsors taking into account persons who are infected with SARS-CoV-2? The answer is yes. And have the sponsors shared data associated with the response at one month post-administration of the current Omicron bivalent booster vaccine? Well, no, but the sponsors report that they are expecting this data in the coming weeks. But again, this demonstrates it is still quite early on in the life cycle of the clinical trial. Pfizer BioNTech emphasizes that this data is important for their move to support an approval submission to regulatory authorities, meaning full licensure and global registration of the Omicron BA4 and BA5 adapted by bivalent COVID-19 vaccine. Now, are the sponsors testing this new bivalent experimental vaccine on children? The answer is yes. They initiated a phase one, two, and three clinical trial studying the effect of this investigational product on children aged six months to 11 years of age. So what then are the study details of the children's study? Well, they are targeting children as young as six months old, and this study commenced on September 23rd of 2022 and runs through February of 2025. The sponsors are investigating the safety, probing for the extent of side effects, as well as immune responses of the bivalent Omicron vaccine booster in healthy children. Now, some food for thought here. The vaccination of very young children involving SARS-CoV-2 is controversial. However, the medical industry, government, and most of the health establishments, when factoring in the urgencies of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
came to the conclusion that these studies are necessary, especially considering the risks associated with emerging variants. If they go into wide circulation, they say it could trigger another deadly surge of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, on the other hand, there is a growing movement building here in the United States, if not elsewhere, to keep young children away from these vaccines. SARS-CoV-2 has never been high risk in young children for morbidity and mortality. And in fact, it is not clear if any child with no comorbidities has ever died directly due to COVID-19 to date. Internal trial site news estimates in deducing the number of children that have been exposed to COVID-19 could be as high as 80%, and a combination of vaccine-induced and natural immunity offers considerable ongoing protection. But now you have to factor in the higher risks of myocarditis and pericarditis among young persons, especially in young men, which has led a growing number of people to question the risk-benefit analysis-based argument for vaccination at this stage. An example would be the recent proclamation by Florida's Surgeon General declaring that the state, Florida, does not recommend vaccinating young persons. Not surprisingly, a huge backlash from a confluence of government and healthcare sector and indirect industry soon followed. Now, in the current children's trial, one of the cohorts is most certainly an experimental lot, and the ethics of the experiment most certainly will be questioned by some quarters in American society. Administering three doses of the mRNA-based vaccine in children as young as six months old is bound to create concern, especially considering the current vaccine's focus may not align with new emerging variants. Meanwhile, after the overwhelming failure to both handle the spread of the pandemic and the failed promises of leaders both here in the States that tactics such as inhumane lockdowns to stop the spread of the virus and the forced mandates of emergency use authorization vaccines on populations at large, Anti-vaccination or anti-vax sentiment, both in the developed world and the developing worlds, has grown considerably. It has become a global phenomenon, as various concerns around vaccination have been boiling to the surface, especially after the abuses by governments and pharmaceutical industry in some continents. A sort of health revisionism is building momentum, with profound, and as many would argue, very dangerous implications long term. The government's actions here in the U.S., for example, enforcing the vaccine down everyone's throats while giving broad immunity to the vaccine producers has gone a long way in building resentment among the population. The government's mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic response served only to fuel or intensify this anti-vax movement, arguably leading to an even more dangerous situation for those that understand the benefits of tried and true vaccines. Case in point, let's take a look at what trial site news founder Daniel O'Connor said about all of this. He said, quote, I know of really smart general practitioners, specialists and nurses, and even some scientists that had questions about some of the many vaccines introduced over the past few decades, yet were overall supportive of the vaccination imperative. But now, some of these folks have gone completely in the other direction, becoming 100% supportive of the anti-vax movement. This even applies to vaccines considered tried and true, such as the polio vaccine, which represents a dangerous trend. So the fear concerning vaccine hesitancy driving at least in part government and industry overreach during the COVID-19 pandemic now becomes even more extreme as the various pro-vaccination schemes hatched, developed, and delivered by the government, often ironically contracting with high-priced ad and PR agencies involving promulgation of misinformation, denial of vaccine side effects, mass censorship of doctors, and the like, has led to a growing distrust, paranoia, and the fuel for even broader health freedom movements inspired at least in some cases by truly questionable conspiracy theories. The credibility, even the legitimacy of once world-class agencies such as the FDA and the CDC are now questioned by growing numbers of, in, of, in some cases, influential sources. Health-focused agencies of the executive branch of the U.S. federal government are a case in point. They have followed a rigid, non-creative, one-size-fits-all messaging strategy when it comes to COVID-19 vaccination recommendations. Yet, as we here at Trial Site News have continuously reported, there are distinct signals showing differences between the different vaccines. A prominent example early on was the Janssen vaccine, evidencing lower efficacy and greater risks associated with thrombocytopenia. The government finally moved to a different recommendation, but that took a while. Yet, 
Even with the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, the government still relies on a one-size-fits-all, except for children, where some efforts were, was made to differentiate recommendations. But distinctions between the mRNA vaccines evident in the data exist and are not openly discussed in any meaningful way. Now, trial site news founder Daniel O'Connor also emphasized that few vaccinations centers appropriately delineated the known safety issues, albeit rare, even though the EUA fact sheet and then labels highlighted them in the fine print. People were just told over and over again that the vaccines are safe and effective without acknowledgement of a couple of factors. First, known risk factors, and B, unknown unknowns, and for this, you can see the package insert or fact sheet for both Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, respectively, when it comes to pregnant and or lactating women. And then you have known differences between the vaccines. Now, let's talk about censorship of thought. You have our wonderful government, which in a quest to control the narrative, embarked on a well-orchestrated information suppression campaign that's apparent to vast and growing numbers here in the U.S. society. For example... Persons that do have legitimate vaccine injuries have little resources, with incredibly ineffective antiquated vaccine injury laws. Lawsuits are now revealing a degree of orchestration of censorship involving the U.S. government, big media, and big tech, along with support by industry, while fact checkers are routinely employed to label any blog, media, or commentator that dare question the status quo as a quack, a lunatic, or a conspiracy theorist. Of course, the government and various media have sought to blur the lines between anti-vax groups and those critical of how the government has responded to the pandemic, but their fear of vaccine hesitancy and the devious tactics of bearing any opposing thought would in fact lead to even more intense vaccine hesitancy, now evidenced by the incredibly low uptake of the current bivalent Omicron booster vaccine. Less than 5% of the population is participating here in the U.S. So where do we go from here then? Well, as obvious as it sounds, transparency must become imperative moving forward. Democratic, market-driven societies thrive with educated citizens, informed consumers, and a well-run, efficient, transparent government. Agencies in charge of health care aren't exempt from these goals. The faster the government pivots its approach with these concepts in mind, the better the outcomes will be for all. And perhaps, just as importantly, those who played a role in all of this madness of censorship need to pay a price. Without it, I fear that the public trust in the medical institutions may be lost for a generation, if not longer. And that, my friends, will bring our episode to a close once more. As always, thank you so much for joining me on the program today. From Trial Site News, I am Adrian, and I will see you all next time.